This is Mary Mallon. You might know her better as Typhoid Mary, quite possibly the world's most famous super spreader. Mallon, who was an asymptomatic typhoid carrier, worked as a cook for wealthy families in New York in the early 20th century. She infected at least 53 others, most of them people she prepared the meals for. Eventually, after triggering multiple outbreaks, she was tracked down and forcibly quarantined by authorities until her death three decades later. Fast forward to the present, a new pandemic and a novel virus. What have we learned about super spreaders? Welcome to DW's COVID-19 special. I'm Janelle Dumala on Thanks for Joining Us. We start in South Korea, where a few incidences saw individuals spread the disease to hundreds and even thousands. So-called super-spreading events guide the preventive measures in place today. Measures aimed at groups most likely to infect others. Students especially seem to be listening. DW's Frank Smith reports. <laughs> Young South Koreans are increasingly sensitive to the potential they have to carry and infect others with COVID-19, even if they are not suffering from serious symptoms. These university students say they do not have the virus, and they go out occasionally, but behave much differently than they did before the pandemic. I have sensitive lungs, so I catch a cold often and have a runny nose and sneeze a lot, and these may be symptoms of COVID-19. It also has asymptomatic cases, so I'm afraid that I'll harm others, so I'm careful and wear a mask. South Korea's concern stems from several events in which individual carriers caused large cluster outbreaks. The plight of the Itaewon shopping and entertainment district in Seoul demonstrates the potential economic impact of a super spreader cluster outbreak. In early May, a reportedly asymptomatic virus carrier visited several bars and nightclubs in the area. Hundreds became infected with COVID-19 and businesses here still haven't recovered. The government is now looking to reopen some so-called high-risk venues, although strict antivirus measures will be enforced. We have 12 types of facility, including nightclubs, bars and karaoke rooms, that are designated high-risk. In such a place, both operator and customer will be required by law to follow prevention guidelines, including keeping a visitor log, wearing masks and practicing thorough ventilation and disinfection. The transmission of the virus by asymptomatic carriers remains a contentious issue. Some experts believe so-called super spreaders lied to authorities when they actually had COVID-19 symptoms. Still, such events have generated stronger adherence to prevention. The Itaewon Club incident had the biggest impact on me because the virus had almost disappeared. With a little more care, I thought things could get better and I hoped I could go to school next semester. It was hard for me to see the coronavirus situation get serious again after that cluster outbreak. South Korea's new cases this week again dropped below 50 per day. But everyone knows just one event could change the situation dramatically. Joining us now is Dr. Udo Buchholz. He's an epidemiologist specializing in infectious respiratory diseases here in Germany. Welcome to our program, Dr. Buchholz. Now, clearly super spreaders have existed before in this history of pandemics. Is there anything different about the phenomenon of super spreading in today's COVID-19 pandemic compared to previous ones? Well, I don't really think so. Um, what is perhaps different is that we uh, now are starting to understand this phenomenon of uh, super spreading uh, better. Um, to my mind, there are three major, three important ingredients uh, to it. The first is um, the person that is infectious. Um, so there seems to be a difference between persons if they, um, uh, in, in, in terms of how many small particles uh, they emit and they, that are infectious. And when we um, measure 10 different persons, when they just breathe or speak um, uh, the same sentence or the same words, they uh, emit very different amount of, of these small particles that are particularly now uh, capable of being inhaled and then getting to the, to the deep parts of the lung directly. The second ingredient is the setting. 
Um, we see frequently um, uh, outbreaks when they have uh, high attack rates that occur in closed settings, very rarely outdoors, but closed settings, and particularly when they are ventilated poorly, when, uh, when the people have stayed a long time in it, um, um, and then when there's a um, high um, particle emitting activity, let's say like singing, screaming, and so on. And then the, the third aspect is, of course, the um, uh, the, the person at the other end who are exposed to to the um, infectious uh, particles. So um, vulnerable people, uh, vulnerable persons in older age or that have uh, certain uh, preconditions uh, when there is a, um, when the um, a group uh, has a large part of those, um, then um, there's a higher chance also of uh, having a higher attack rate. So we're talking about people, settings and susceptibility. Given that, how should one assess risk when going to well-populated areas or attending large events? As we know, not every mass gathering has resulted in lots of new infections. At the same time, smaller gatherings have also been known to produce new clusters. The, the thing is to always behave as if there was an infectious person around or where I am. And then it comes down to uh, why I call them the five C's uh, as a sort of acronym. Uh, so number one is uh, keep your hands clean, disinfect them regularly, hand hygiene. Then the second one is cover your nose and your mouth. Uh, both are important, not just one of them. And uh, then are the three avoidances, uh, avoid close uh, contacts, close contact to other persons or close contact settings. Uh, then number four is um, avoid closed rooms, particularly when they are poorly ventilated. That is a very important issue uh, nowadays. And uh, um, lastly, uh, the five, fifth C is avoid um, crowded places. Is there any way to stop super spreaders? And is concentrating on individuals even a sensible strategy? Um, I would not concentrate, I believe, on uh, on persons. Uh, the, what, what is the, probably the more important part is the setting. Uh, and um, there, there are a number of um, numerous um, outbreaks uh, where there has been um, intense transmission, where there was uh, it was an uh, indo uh, indoors environment, a closed setting, uh, closed doors, and we have um, poor ventilation, and then in addition, perhaps some activity that created a lot of uh, particles, let's say like singing, uh, uh, screaming, and such loud speaking, uh, and so that uh, that these small particles uh, that um, are able to float in the air and do not drop very rapidly, they uh, can accumulate uh, over time. It's also a matter of how, how much time this group um, spends in that sort of uh, um, uh, setting or room. Now, as public life reawakens in many places, in many parts of the world, you have bars being reopened and restaurants and gyms. You've talked about the importance of ventilation and perhaps like not spending too much time indoors. But how else can super spreading events be prevented? From a sort of general public health standpoint, uh, one of the most important ones. It's, it depends which room you which room you choose for which kind of event. So if you uh, uh, have a sort of short meeting, business meeting, you can uh, clearly choose another si type of room than when you are a choir and want to uh, want to rehearse. So you uh, perhaps, perhaps need some some other type of room where, it's, uh, where the uh, where the air is um, go is drawn away, is coming from below, is drawn away like in sort of in cinema sort of. Since they have often that or concert rooms, sometimes they have that. So they they should be very careful um, which kind of room uh, they they gather. So redefining which rooms are fit for which purpose. Thank you very much, Dr. Udo Buchholz. He specializes in infectious respiratory diseases at the Robert Koch Institute in Germany. Thank you for your insights. You're very welcome. And now it's time for your questions. Here's our science correspondent, Derek Williams. Can a mother who is asymptomatic breastfeed it must be terrifying for the mother of an infant to test positive for COVID-19, whether she displays symptoms or, or not, because the relationship is such an intimate one physically that it seems 
highly unlikely that the baby uh, won't contract the disease as well. Uh, despite the threat, though, both the WHO and most national health authorities urge mothers who have tested positive for the disease, whether they're symptomatic or not, to continue to breastfeed because the benefits of breastfeeding and skin-to-skin and -skin contact between mother and child uh, substantially outweigh any risks associated with COVID-19 for the child. So it, it still isn't 100% certain that, that breast milk always remains completely free from the virus, but, but the evidence indicates that it's not really spread that way. Mothers who test positive should, however, follow a list of precautions to try to prevent passing the virus along to their baby. Uh, if, if this is an issue for you, I, I recommend really taking the time to read the much more extensive information posted on the WHO and, and CDC websites. Um, it can actually help calm your fears, especially to learn that, that most newborns and infants who get COVID-19 uh, have mild or, or no symptoms and will eventually, as far as we can tell, recover fully.